Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with another of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today, we'll examine the 10 foundation stones of human civilization which are presently under attack. The psalmist asks, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalm 11.3. But it's not a rhetorical question. The answer is in the next verse. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. Ah, that's better. He's aware of the entire situation and he's in control as well. And it's good for us to be aware too. So here are the 10 foundations under assault. Here's number one. The creation of the universe. Hard to believe, isn't it? The evidence that God has given in the creation is so obviously planned, designed, and yet men refuse to believe it. In Romans chapter 1, God's objection to man is not that he doesn't know God, but that knowing God, he doesn't glorify him as God. And so the evidence God considers to be convincing, and uh, this evidence that life has come into our world, scientists know that it's impossible for life to come from non-life. And yet they would rather believe that fable than to believe in God. So when the Genesis story begins, we see information transfer, and God said, and God said, transferring from the divine mind into matter, God's plan manifested so we can see what God was thinking when he made these various and wonderful creations of his. So the origin of life is by a miracle of God. God is the only source of life in the universe and every kind of life can be traced back to him. That is under frontal assault today. People object to the idea that God is the creator because if he's my creator, then I'm answerable to him and men don't want that. Our second foundation that's under attack is the making of humanity as male and female. Again, seems to be pretty obvious. It certainly has been an unquestioned position for many centuries and yet today Again, it's under attack. No more and no less male and female. And when people object to Christians not believing in science, this is one area where science is clear. That if you've got the Y chromosome, you're a male. And we understand that there are difficulties and there are dysfunctions, but the idea that God has established not only male and female, but he's established marriage as monogamous and heterosexual. Men have come along and overturned that idea. And the term marriage actually means something. If you go into a plumber's shop or into an electrician's department, you will see a male and a female. These are two distinct but complementary parts that exactly match each other. So to use the term homosexual marriage is to take two similar things that do not fit together and pretend that they do. You can call it whatever you like, whatever kind of relationship you wish to mention, but, but as far as marriage is concerned, marriage was something God designed, and he designed it specifically with a male and a female for life. That was God's plan. Our third is the divine right to set the moral code. People really kick at this one. You remember how the Lord spoke to Saul and said, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. And God has set up boundaries and barriers for our safety, like guardrails on a dangerous road. And yet men object to that idea. And they would like to say that even if there is no God, we can still be moral. The question is not whether an atheist can be good or not. The question is, what is the objective basis of that? 
How can you measure that? And so to argue against the existence of God, but then turn around and say that God is evil, is a nonsensical position to take. The idea that God has set the moral code, he planted in the garden one tree that he told Adam and Eve not to touch. All the trees belong to God, but he was very generous with them and said, you can enjoy all the trees you want, don't touch that one. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because God was saying, you're not God and I am the arbiter of what's right and wrong. And when we slip off that slope, then everything becomes relative. Unless there is a transcendent lawgiver, it all comes down to the schoolyard taunt, says who? You say that's wrong, says who? On what basis can you say it's wrong? If we don't have the absolute authority of God, then there's no way that anyone can determine what is good and what is evil. Our next attack is the setting of the bounds of the nations. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, God has determined the uh, course and culmination of history. And so, as the uh, false rent prophets in, in Babylon confessed, only God can prophesy. This great prophecy of this image with the head of gold going down to feet of iron and clay was God laying out the bounds of the nations thus far and no further. Just as he set the bounds of the oceans, that's as far as the waves could go, so he set the bounds of the nations. And Nebuchadnezzar tried to thwart that by making his image all of gold, as if to say, my kingdom is not going to end. But there's only one kingdom that will never have an end, and that is the kingdom of God and his Christ. So God has determined how far a nation can go. And God is very balanced and very fair in his position here. Sometimes the nations look like wild animals tearing each other to pieces. Sometimes they look like Superman in the amazing technological skills and creative powers they have. Sometimes they look like a spreading tree with all the little birds and animals coming to find their shade underneath. The protective reach of America allows Taiwan to exist because otherwise China would swallow them up. And so we have these varying views of the nations, but God has set the limits to what nations can do. And while over the centuries many have tried to establish a worldwide empire, and there's one last one coming with the force of Antichrist, God will say, no, that's it, that's the limit. And uh, we read of this wrecking ball, this great stone cut out without hands that comes and smashes man's efforts to nothing in order to establish then the eternal kingdom of Christ. Our fifth attack is the right to select one nation, which is Israel, as the channel of his blessing. That little piece of real estate, only a few miles wide, that city of Jerusalem, not on any great thoroughfare, not on any great river, it's in the news every day. The United Nations has a standing objection to the nation of Israel. Every time they meet, there's an objection to the nation of Israel. The world says that they recognize what God prophesied that it's a cup of trembling, it's a stumbling stone, it's something always in their way. The world's nations, it seems, could be happy if it wasn't for Israel. And we recognize that the devil is behind this. From the very beginning, he has sought to destroy the Jewish people in order to make God out to be a liar. But God has selected the nation of Israel through whom all the greatest blessings have come to the world. And so, the giving of the scriptures, the giving of the Son, the giving of salvation, and the giving of the Spirit have all come through the nation of Israel. Whether the world objects to it or not, the little nation of Israel will be supernaturally preserved through the darkest days of history still to come. They will be sealed 
in the midst of the weeks and preserved, and someday Israel will be that nation reborn in a day, Ezekiel's valley of dry bones coming to life, and they will become the head of the nations instead of the tail. And though they have been managing the kingdoms of the Gentiles through the centuries, they will have their own empire under the right of God, under the rule of God, and they will gain their position of glory. And the Apostle Paul says, if their fall has been the enriching of the Gentiles, what will their restoration be? What a marvelous day it will be when people like Daniel and Joseph will be ruling in the kingdoms of earth under the tutelage of God. It's going to be a wonderful day. Our sixth attack is the prerogative of God to judge humanity in righteousness. Yes, I should have mentioned earlier on that uh, not only does God establish the moral code, but he has determined the consequence of sin. The scripture says the wages of sin is death. It's not that God has arbitrarily chosen death. It is the logical consequence. If you cut yourself off from God, who is the source of all life, the only option is to die. And God has declared that death is the rightful consequence of sin. But God is going to do something. People keep saying, why doesn't God do something? He is going to do something, but when he does something, next time he's going to do everything. And the reason he hasn't done it up till now, Peter tells us, is because he's not willing that any should perish. He's long-suffering, and he's waiting for some of the bad guys to acknowledge their sin and bow at the cross and join his team. But at a certain point, he is going to send his son back, according to 2 Thessalonians 1, in flaming fire, wreaking vengeance on all those that know not God and obey not the gospel. So God has a right to judge. Again, people object to this idea. They object to God dealing with the Canaanites. This is one of their reasons for not believing the Bible. And they say the God of the Old Testament is different from the Jesus of the New, but that's not true. Jesus himself is the judge, and he will sit on the great white throne. And the same one who today says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, is also the same one who's going to say, depart from me, ye wicked, into everlasting judgment. Jesus does have the right, and he is the supreme heir of all things, he is the sustainer of all things, he's the savior, and he's the judge. And someday people are going to have to make that decision. Will he be their savior now, or will he be their judge? Those are the only two options. And number seven, the control of God over the forces of nature. Hmm. The uh, forces of nature are utilized by God, whether famine or flood or whatever it might be, to bring judgment on the nations and to bring discipline to God's people. We see this all through the Bible, that God visited the nations in doing certain things. The forces of nature are not random. God is the one who, as we read in the book of Job, he's the one who controls the snow, controls the rain, who does these things. Now, he has set laws in motion, and generally speaking, those laws play out in our world. But God is quite free to step into his world and to use these forces to bring nations to their knees to bring God's people to repentance and to restore righteousness in the world. And we have many such examples. The plagues in Egypt were like many pictures of God controlling nature to bring about his perfect ends. And the Bible tells us that in the end times, the same sort of thing is going to happen, except in a more extreme way with the stars falling from heaven and so on. When God acts in judgment, when, when God says enough, and he releases the forces that are all around us every day. We see them, we know how powerful lightning is, we know how powerful earthquakes are, we know what a tornado will do, and yet man becomes increasingly oblivious to the fact that God uses these things to bring us 
to repentance, bring us to our knees. And if people won't pay attention to the quiet voice of God, God knows how to raise his voice. Another one of these foundational truths is the limits of human life in his control. Right, so the Bible tells us that, that God gives man a measure of time. At the present, it's three score and ten, and if by reason of strength you live a little longer, it's going to be with aches and pains. People object to God controlling these things. And so at one end of life, we see euthanasia, where we've figured out how to extend lifespan here in the West, and we don't like God to tell us when we have to die. And so euthanasia is being introduced as a means of, as it were, taking that out of God's control, and I'll decide when and where and how I die. At the other end of life, we see the horrible slaughter of innocent children in the womb. And the use of abortion is basically saying to God, you have no right to decide who's born into this world. I'll decide that. And it's murder. There's no question but that it's murder. What a, what a horrible holocaust. Over 50 million children in America since Roe v. Wade and over 100 million worldwide. You can hardly imagine such a thing. And yet, people will give an account for this. The Lord Jesus said, it would be better that you were cast into the sea with a millstone around your neck than to offend one of these little ones. These little ones, he says, whose angels behold my Father's face in heaven. Thankfully, there's forgiveness. Even for people who have, who have gone through an abortion, God will forgive them and restore them. And someday they will see their children again if they put their trust in Christ. And number nine, the communication of absolute truth. Well, uh, people have this idea that uh, there's no way you can know anything for sure because our senses are fallible. There are times when a pilot's in a plane, he thinks he's flying upright and he's actually going straight into the ground. And if he doesn't trust his instruments, he's in big trouble. Sometimes we are dreaming and we're absolutely convinced something's actually happening. And so they say there's no way that we can know for sure anything because of our inability to perceive reality in its exactitude. But this excuses the notion of absolute truth by revelation. God has revealed his truth so that we can know. These things are written that you might know. And so because God has revealed truth, it is possible for us to understand his word. Now again, people say, well, of course the same problem exists because when you're reading the Bible, how do you know what the Bible says? And God's thought of that too. And so the very same one who inspired the word of God, moved holy men of God to write the word, is the same one who is my instructor. And of course he knows what the word of God means. And so the whole issue then is, will I happily submit to what the Spirit of God shows me? And if I do, then I can know the truth, and the truth will set me free. And so the truth is given by revelation, and here's the second glitch as far as the unbeliever is concerned, it's only perceived by faith. By faith we understand. One man said to me, he was a university professor, if I have to come to God the same way a little child does, I just won't come. And I said, have you always had this animosity towards children? And he was quite affronted by that. And I said, well, what you're saying is, God, I want you to design a way of salvation that only intellectuals like me can understand and let the little children go to hell. Is that what you mean? No, God designed his truth so that a blind beggar who'd never been a day in school lying on the streets of Calcutta could know the truth and the truth could set him free. So the truth is accessible. It's on the bottom shelf. It's been made accessible to every person by divine revelation through faith in what God says. And our final foundation stone on the list to round off our most counterculturalist in our top tens 
is the provision of only one way of salvation. And that way of salvation is through Christ and his finished work by simple faith, by grace through faith. That's how the gospel comes to us. And so man has a real choice and a real responsibility to respond to God's offer. And people have somehow made this out to be a narrow thing. They say, well, you know, only you Christians and only the Christians who believe in the right way can go to heaven. Well, the offer that God has made is a universal offer. Whosoever will may come. And the way we come to God is not by being clever. People say, so how did you get saved and someone else didn't get saved? Was it because you were smarter than anyone else? No. Jesus died at a place called Skull Hill for a reason. A skull is just an empty head. And if you're going to get saved, you have to give up your arguments, your reasonings, and just believe what God says. It's by a simple act of belief. In fact, the Bible puts it the other way around and says, unless you do become as a little child, you can't enter in. So all around the world, there are people who argue against this notion that there's only one Savior. But the fact of the matter is that no other religion offers a Savior. Everywhere else, they tell you, you need to pay, pray, obey. You need to turn prayer wheels or feed idols or climb on your hands and knees up this mountain. Whatever it is, you need to contribute to your own salvation. But Jonah's words are true. Salvation is of the Lord. There's only one way to be saved. And when we put our trust in him, he saves us. So here's this pagan city of Nineveh, these wicked people who advertise their wickedness. They make these great murals of them ripping babies out of pregnant mothers and dragging the men off with hooks through their cheeks. Horrible, horrible situation. And Jonah comes in there with this knowledge that salvation is of the Lord. Only God could save Nineveh. And did he? Yes, he did. And Jesus said, someday there'll be witnesses for the prosecution to confront all those people who have had Bibles and gospel preachers and radio programs and tracts and a thousand opportunities to believe and who turned up their nose at the simplicity of the gospel and said there must be some other way. There's no other way. And the writer to the Hebrews puts it clearly. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? There is only one way, and Jesus is that way. But that way is for everyone. People say, what about Hindus and Muslims? And Jesus loves Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists too. And he died for them too, and he wants to save them too. But they'll have to give up their false belief and accept God's way of salvation. And if they are, the fact is that there will be people from all those religious groups now saved by the grace of God in heaven from every kindred, tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And we will see then how great God's salvation is that has been able to reach the multitudes. A number that no one can number, says John, all saved by that solitary man who hung on Calvary's tree to save us from our sin. So, while there is an attack against these foundation stones, behind it all, God says, as he writes in the book of Hebrews, that he himself is shaking the foundations. He himself is allowing this to happen. And why is he doing it? We read here, yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So God is saying, I'm allowing everything to be shaken up so that people will begin to look for anything that can't be shaken. And there's only one thing that can't be shaken, and that's Christ's kingdom. And if they find refuge in that, the rock, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, they don't have to be afraid of these things. They don't have to be afraid of the attack because God always leads us in triumph. He's already won the battle, and we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So be encouraged, folks. In spite of what's going on in the world today, 
God is in his throne. He sits supreme. He's in control. His eyelids test the children of men. He sees what's going on. And he's right on schedule. And he's bringing things, ultimately, not to ruin, but to the feet of the Lord Jesus, who will rule supreme forever and ever. And all those who trust him will reign with him.